Mark, 13th chapter of Matthew, same parable as given to us. Jesus said, the sword went out just of his seed, and as he sowed some of the gospel seed, it was falling to the wayside there. And it was trodden down, and the pound of the air bowed it. Some of the gospel fell upon the heart that was rocky. First the room for Jesus, as soon as it was sprung up, it went to the wine, because it lacked moisture. Some of the seed fell among thorns. The thorns sprang up, but it didn't choke it. Others fell on the good ground, and it sprang up. It bare fruit a hundredfold. When Jesus had sent these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now for our two messages, we've been attempting to enter into this one phrase, the word trodden down. This morning I want the Lord willing to continue this. I had thought when I started reading that I would be speaking on the four photographs that's recorded, the four pictures that are quite bright and vivid in this little story which Jesus gave us. But the word was trodden down. I never noticed this sentence or this phrase until about three and a half years ago. For 33 years, the length of the life of Jesus before I noticed this phrase. I've never been a son on it, never heard it dealt with, spoken to, or announced. The word trodden down. Well, yesterday morning, we were bringing to your attention that the word has been trodden down in the church by trustless hearts. Every spirit in a prison that claims to be a Christian that isn't a trusting spirit causes the word to be fresh underfoot. That's a tremendous revelation. All people that are not trusting Jesus but are going on in the form are actually, instead of helping the word and cultivating it, are just going out in the garden and tramping on all the roads that they can find. Every tender plant that is tramping it back. Every person in the church that's not trusting Jesus, he's trusting himself, he's trying to work it out in his own ideas, that person is like a child in the garden that just posed as a magnet to the tender plants today. So the only way we can really work in the garden is to trust in Jesus. Trusting Jesus. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by. Trusting him, what hair befall, trusting Jesus. That is all, but that's a lot. So the heart that fails to trust Jesus is tramping the tender plan. Regardless of how beautiful he can give the word, or she can present the word, or live the word, if that soul fails to trust the Lord, that soul will be tapping the word underfoot. You see, we're not called on to know a lot, we're just called on to trust him. He's never said very much in this word that I need to know very much. He said, you follow me. In fact, we've learned so much, and we're trying to find out so much that we have forgotten to trust. So the trustless heart is trapping the word underfoot, crushing it. That's why many churches and many church organizations is powerless and barren. It's because they're working in the flesh rather than trusting Jesus. This is so simple, but it's so profound. I never read this in a book. No one's ever told me this. God has been teaching me a little at a time. I'm in the kindergarten when everybody can see. But the trustless heart is crushing the word of the foot. The soul that works in the flesh, works it out, and we'll do this. We'll not trust for his guidance. We'll do it ourselves. We'll work this out. I'll do it. The result of I'll do it is trying to get out of foot. What are you able to do here? 
Many times the persons that feel the most unqualified to teach a Sunday school lesson, they say, I'm not really, I feel myself so unqualified. Perhaps they'll do more good than the person says, I know this material, I'm able to do it. I've got the insight. I have the, I have a hold of the strings. I know the gears. I know the text. I know it from beginning to end. God will take somebody who knows that he's limited. And he'll get more spiritual fruit in the lives of those who listen. He'll get more calories in the soul. He'll get more vitamins in the heart. Because God will be doing it. You see, if I were to try to do it in my own strength, oh, we could give beautiful words, but the words would be infinite unless I am trusted with all my heart. I was in the great camp meeting in Anderson, Indiana, and I listened to one of the most tremendous sermons. It was scholarly. It was love. The words and the thoughts were great. The subject was superb. It was excellent. It was so mighty in words, but not one time the Holy Ghost witnessed in my heart. Not one time. You have to witness not one time God witnessed in my heart. There's several have the witness of the Holy Ghost. It was scholarly. It was mighty. It was wonderful. It was about the great doctrine of the church. The Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God. It was a masterpiece. I told Reverend Robert Morgan as we sit together, I said, this is a masterpiece. But it's powerless. No power. If I don't trust in the Lord with all my heart, then the Spirit can operate through me. Or through you. We must be like little children. If there's the slightest little thing in your life that's dark, you will trample the word underfoot. If there's the slightest secret sin in your life, the power will not witness to the tone of your message. Amen. 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 Now this isn't so good, it's true. If there's the slightest thing in the life, slightest deception in the life, the word will be emptiness, though it's beautifully rendered and marvelously declared. If there is the slightest little thing underneath, very deep that no one else knows but the person themselves, when they speak, the word will be taught. It may be beautifully given, but inside there will be no joy, no glory, no way of witness. When Jesus leads, it is so bright. God is leading by the stern. The father of Peggy and Kathy. How God's anointing him on these, in these messages. God is blessing him and just speaking to him and lifting his soul. He's trusting Jesus. He wants God to give the message through him to all the people throughout the world. God's just burning in this heart and that heart and this heart and that heart and all around. Praise the Lord. He's stirring people because this servant is wanting all than anything else to give the message. Robert Morgan is a meek man. He doesn't uh, talk very loud. He doesn't talk very long. But I sit to listen to him and I'll tell you, God, this witness to my heart. And I said, oh, I'm happy. Praise God. I got that in my soul. Oh, look at me. I said, praise the Lord. I can hardly be quiet. <laughs> See, he just, sits, he just stands and he doesn't say words loudly at all, but oh, the Holy Ghost is in his side. Oh, I tell you, it's so full of sweetness. It's so full of joy. He is witness to my heart. He's a trusting spirit. He's trusting Jesus. He wants to do God's will more than anything. So the Lord wants to speak to his servants. I remember some years ago, back 25 years ago, when Dr. Walter Meyer would preach on the radio. His voice was irritating. Oh, his voice was kind of gruff, grouchy. But I'm telling you, when that man would preach, I'd get the witness of the Holy Ghost one right or the other. He'd just witness, witness, witness right within me. The power is like going through that gold there. I said to my wife, I said, hey, when this man preached, the Holy Ghost tells me this is true. Yeah. His voice was irritating. It was grouchy and gruff away, but oh, the Spirit of Jesus lived in his heart. I said, he doesn't go with a good voice. He goes with anyone with a voice. You see, it, it's not the tone of the voice. 
It's not the texture of the resident, it's the spirit of Jesus that is within you. Just as soon as someone gets up in the church that's in the spirit, as soon as they do, I know it in my heart just like that. For the Holy Spirit, the inner gift. And it blesses me, it strengthens me, it thrills me. But I meet people that are clear with God and love Jesus supremely. And the word was thrown down by a trustless spirit. A heart that is not trusting, but brother is walking in the flesh, analyzing, knowing this, knowing that. God has revealed to me in the last few years that our churches are filled with people that want to know the questions. They want to know the answers to all their questions. They'll call from over the United States, Brother Hell, how about this? What about this? How is this? And so forth. And all over the land is wanting to know the answers. My friend, if you will come to Jesus and walk with him and wait before him as our brother saying about waiting upon the Lord, he will answer your question at a most unexpected moment. If you walk and obey him, he will call on you to become the answer. When anybody asks me a question, I, I begin to tremble and shake. Even though the Lord has revealed to me many wonderful things that I'm unworthy of ever revelation. He told me of the earthquake in Alaska 105 hours before it took place. He, took, he told me my wife was with me each time when the tornadoes were hitting in Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, when hundreds of people were killed. He told me 72 hours in advance. And after it was over, the Holy Spirit revealed to some men of God, my old heart, that had been for a lot of prayer and crying, 70 hours in the bed, there would have been 600 and some more killed. Yeah. And the Holy Ghost men over the United States, they, the Holy Spirit is witnesses, and he's witnessing to them. Ten people here now. And he will tell me how many he's witnessing to here. Even though he has, he has revealed these wonderful things to him, yet I know that by his grace and his spirit will I ever know again. And I will everything in all the world for the precious gift of the Holy Spirit that speaks and reveals, but he wants us to wait upon him that he might give the answer. I recall one day I was in a large church in Evansville, and they said that we want you to be here in the morning. We want to ask you some questions. Oh, I said, really? You don't know how little I know. They said that we want to have you to come. We want to ask you very things. And I said, but my limitation, my insufficiency, my inadequacy, my nothingness is before the throne. I will, I will know very much. They said, but we want you to come. We won't ask you. We want to ask you the questions. Now, I have known the pastor's wife since 1922. Her sister and I went through school together. Pure, holy people. I don't know if two more pure daughters ever went through that school than they are. And that they were. And their parents are pure people that love Jesus. Her husband, I knew in the University of 1934. He and I had been acquainted a long time. And they asked me to come to that room and I cried out and I said, Lord, I really don't know anything. If those people could see all that I do know down here beside all that I don't know, they see all that I don't know, they couldn't see anything that I do know. So I went in the room trembling. Crying, saying, Lord, help me, for I do not know the answer. I walked into the room and I sit down. And here was the people, this way and this way. And I started to pray. I was empty as an old barrel where it hadn't rained for weeks, it seemed to me like. <laughs> That's how little I knew. And I started to talk to the stranger of Galilee at the right hand of God. As I started to talk to him, I became so delighted with him, I didn't know what to quit. The glory fell all around, it seemed like showers of blessings to come in every direction. Before I knew it, I was in the desert sand into an oasis. The singing of birds and the rippling of streams and the fragrance of flowers. It seemed like morning time and dawn had come. And the love and the light of heaven was all around, and the end was on every side within my soul. And I was some way seedy. At the feet of him who was called wonderful counsel of the land and all the everlasting father. The one who kind of love was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask for a thing according to the power of the work of us. I was praying like a house of fire. 
Within three minutes, I said, Jesus, they couldn't hear it, but I was, I was praying in my heart as well as my words, and I said, Lord, is there anybody here you want to heal in this church? Probably no one had ever been healed in that big church before. He said, yes, I'll heal this woman right to your left. Of course, I didn't know I'd ever seen it before in my life. And I tell you, after I prayed a while, when I got to bring, I just talked, and it just rolled out of me like water comes out of a teaser well. The boy was falling in every direction. I'll tell you, we were all there, and I was as happy as anybody, and I, I wish it had all been on tape and been worth all the recorders I ever saw. <laughs> Because I can't get it again. See, I can never get the same anointing again. It's always different. Everything is different. When you walk with God, He works in very easy. He never works in monotony. The devil works in monotony. The same thing, the same routine, the same. He trips men over women and money and disobedience and strife and trust the spirit and many other things. Just a few of our other call things. The devil call all peoples there. They keep tumbling into this despair. But Jesus never works in monotony. Works in variation. It's always different. It's always fresh. It's like the morning rose. All because of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ here in the world. I was in the morning for some 30 to 45 minutes. And here I was called to come to the room to answer the questions that I went in and didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. All I knew was that I was nothing. That's a lot. Whenever God called the man to do something, he always brings that man that somebody to look like. As Dr. Tuesday said before he could do anything with him. And when I went in, I knew it was nothing. I knew we were anything, but God was everything. And here it was coming upon me and treating me all the finest of the meat and the finest of the wheat and the sweetness of the honey of the honeycomb. They tell us about a parasite alive that can live in it. It's so precious and so beyond all words to describe that after a while I said, I better be quiet. Now I've had such a wonderful time. I've been lost in the wonder of the joyous presence of Jesus the Holy Spirit. So I'll be still for a while and listen to the questions. I'm not sure if they can answer one. But Brother Chapel knows much more about the Bible than I. Here's the word. Maybe someone can help us. We'll try to do the best we know how. This will be limited on our part, but he is all able. So I was quiet and I looked at that group of people. And they looked down and they looked up. I said, what are your questions? I'm trembling now. I don't know what they are. I fear because I, I know I'm limited, but what are your questions? <laughs> they looked down, and there wasn't anybody saying anything. So I said again, would you, would you like to ask the question? We will endeavor to speak. <laughs> One sister over here on the right spoke up and said, Reverend Allen, while you have been speaking, our questions have all been answered. <laughs> What? They said, why our God gave you the message? Our questions have all just been answered in the last 30 minutes. I said, let's bow our heads and give Jesus all the praise. And we tried to say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit that is able to answer the questions that is in the hearts of the people. Sometimes in the door, someone will come to me as they leave when I have strength. You know, I just love people. I love to shake hands with people. But my strength anymore does not endure long. When I, you see, to try to know what God's will is in the meeting is probably takes the strength for the ordinary evangelist of about five nights yeah, preaching. Yeah. Just want to know exactly what is next. It's easy to sing a couple songs, have prayer and announcements and, and preach. That's easy. You've got it all fixed out. But when you have to pray and cry to find out, it takes God to help you. And it takes strength. So my strength, you see... I need more all the time. God says to me, and I'm thrilled with you. I'm thrilled with all of God. See, I'm thrilled. It's in my heart now. I think you can tell it. Yeah. It's inside. We're not worried in the crumbs that would fall. But instead of crumbs, He has sent me at a time of table. Yeah. He's given me the best of the wheat, the finest of the wheat, the delicacies of His holy preparations, at the table of His loveliness, and at the mom's orchards. Of the scriptural truths that fly like blossoms and become almonds, the roots I eat them all and try to now the rest of the water. Because Jesus is Lord. We are not the Christ is Lord. And when they said their questions were all answered, we all rejoiced and said, Jesus, you paid it all. You are the answer. They said, Now you come to lunch now. I said, wait a minute before we leave here before we moved from here about 40 minutes ago, God gave me a revelation that we are privileged to pray for a person in this place for healing of the body. 
And then a real kind tone came into my voice, a tone of compassion and gentleness. Because all of God's men are extremely compassionate. All Christians are known by their gentleness, their long suffering and their patience. The love for beggars, the love for those out there, the love for all people everywhere. The real, kind, gentle, sweet, loving tone came out because I knew this one I was praying for would have never heard anything like it. And so I said, Sister, I don't know what your name is, but you had a physical need. Jesus told me after I got in this room a few minutes, I'm going to pray for you. She said, Did you need me? And it looked like she's going to the floor. The, the pastor said he looked at me like she's going right down to the chair. I said, Yes, yeah, Jesus will hear you. She says, Oh, did you really mean me? I said, You were the one. I said, Jesus, heal this precious tire. May her old woman be whole in the name of Jesus and that. Tears were streaming down her teeth. She got up from the chair, she went out of the hall, she started down with all of this picture. And of course I said, Pastor, where is she going? He said, I don't know. So we got up, we followed her into a little room, and she says, Reverend Chapel, I'll never recover from this. She was weak. She says, I'll never recover from this. She said, here I am, a stranger to this man. He doesn't know me, and he doesn't know that I've been in such pain for so long. But even when I prepare my meals, have my apron, I have to hold my head back while I was preparing the peas and the green beans and the meat. I'd have to hold my head back because the pain would send tears, and they just fall all over my apron. I had to hold back because it would get in my food. He didn't know I was suffering. He didn't know I was the doctor yesterday that put their hand upon my body. Girl, you've got to go to the hospital. And he didn't know it. How will I ever get over this, Brother Chapel? Oh, she said, this is precious. And she got into a car with a little girl going across the city of Evansville to a meeting. And she told us that night, she said, all the way over there, she said, I got to sing, I know the Lord. 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 She said, Brother Hill, I don't even know the song, and when I came to, I was singing it, and a little girl was right out of my face. Turn her up like that, just say, Mama. <laughs> and she ran into this organization where she was to be, and she began to tell these worldly ladies what happened to her, and they all, some of them started crying, and got their arms around, so they had a meeting where she walked. Amen. This is a fantastic. But when we fail to trust, we trample the word underfoot. We match it down, we crush it, it becomes ineffective. But if we trust with all of our heart, he gives the increase. And the endeavor for the glory of our God, Jehovah Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Father, for your spirit, for your presence, for your love. Singing just as I am.